Yeah. Nice. And have you always lived there? I have lived there since I was somewhere around six or seven. So all that counts. I was actually born in Alaska. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have you on today to talk about empowerment. And uh, I just wanted to have the listeners hear from you from the, I, I was going to say the belly of the beast, but that's like a horrible analogy. <laughs> Like, no, that's not right. She's not a beast. Uh, well, depends on what she's teaching. But anyway, um, I just wanted to have them hear from you, from your voice, your background. Uh, what do you do? How long have you been doing it? What are you passionate about? There we go. Take the floor. Take the floor. All right. I am a... Empowerment Self-Defense Instructor. I have been teaching Empowerment Self-Defense for not quite 20 years, but we're getting really close to that 20 year mark. Um, I am a fourth degree black belt in Chang Hong Taekwondo, which is the ITF style of Taekwondo, where I get to hit people in the head, punch people in the head, not just kick them in the head, I get to punch them as well. So it's not the same as the WTF Olympic sport. Um, and it's only once have I ever sparred with uh, uh, WTF Taekwondo um, black belts and uh, they were very mad at me because I kept punching them in the head and they're like, you can't do that. And I'm like, I can in my style, I can, I can. Um, I am also a professional fiction writer. I write science fiction, fantasy, horror stories. I am working on a novel, but most of my fiction has been published so far or short stories in magazines. Ooh. I yeah I have two uh wonderful dogs that I live with as well as a husband and I'm sorry that I listed him last there's no there's no order here <laughs> In yeah. there's no hierarchy here and so that's the um, husband. You know, for hobbies <laughs> I absolutely love to uh cook I consider myself uh, pretty accomplished at that I have made 12 course dinners before for people and really enjoy my cooking. god there's such a thing as 12 course dinners outside of Hobbit land. There really is. It's yes. amazing. And they're fun. And they just uh, require some, some knowledge, some skill, and a lot of organization. Wow. I'm intrigued. Me in a nutshell. Makes me want <laughs> to go on a plane, <laughs> show up at your house, and be like, anytime. Hello. I got a spare room. <laughs> Glad to have you. Me. <laughs> So, oh my gosh, this is so cool. You are a writer. <laughs> I love writing. Um, what, it, tell me about these books. When did you publish your first book? So I published my first, I haven't published a novel yet, a book yet. I've only published short stories. My first short story came out in November of 2017, I believe, in a magazine called Flash Fiction Online. And I've published uh, a couple of other stories since and hope to sell more. I'm working really hard on my fiction career as well as my empowerment self-defense career and um, hoping that that uh, has more publications in the future. And then I'm working on novels. I'm always working on novels and uh, maybe one day I'll be published with a novel as well. Well, there's, uh, there is the novel that Toby Israel and I are co-writing together and we are always looking for <clears throat> different uh, instructors who want to be a chapter i would love to or if you need beta readers be happy okay. to do that as well whatever um intersections we can have with the wonderful passions we have in our life and uh, it's one of the best things so this is one of the best things about the community that i've discovered with esd um and and martial arts as well is all these amazing wonderful women and men uh, in that I've been able to develop these really interesting relationships with in places of passion for all of us. And it just, it fills me with joy. It and really it's, does. It's really, really awesome. It is a great community. Um, how did you get involved with martial arts in the beginning? <laughs> oh, I love telling the story. This is one of my favorite stories. So I grew up in um, middle school and high school as a as an uh, art and theater kid, so I did ballet and I was involved in in the arts that way. There is nothing about my history that would make anybody believe that I could play sports or do sports or do anything 
remotely <laughs> competent when it comes to those kinds of physical activities at all. Uh, always the last one picked in every gym class I ever, ever went to as a child. So it was one of those things that was kind of off my radar as a, a point of existence in, um, in my life. And then of course I become a mother and you know, there are things that you do for your children that you just never, ever, ever would do for yourself. It's a point that comes up often in empowerment, self-defense, but it's so true. At least it was true for me then. So my son was about eight or nine years old and he comes to me one day and says, I want to be a teenage mutant ninja turtle. Oh, wow. And I'm like, <laughs> um, okay, not sure what to do with that. So which one we, did he want to be? Oh, I don't think he really cared. He just wanted to be able to hit things and jump around and do cool things. And so I started looking around at local um, martial arts schools. And what I, we touched on is a Taekwondo school that wasn't far from our home and took him there, loved it instantly, signed him up. We're doing this. And the instructor then sees that every time I come to the class with my son, I uh, have my two other children in tow and that we all three of us sit there and watch while my son does martial arts. So the instructor comes to me and says, you know, this isn't just for boys, right? Like your daughter should do this as well. One of them was too young. So she was kind of out of the equation. Um, but the other one was the right age. And so he said, she should be doing this too. Bring her on to the mat, get her a uniform, tie a white belt around her, bring her on to the mat. And she was really reluctant, but at first, uh, but she did it. So then both of my kids were, two of my, my two oldest children were doing Taekwondo. And then of course he comes to me. And so the, the short version is I got involved in martial arts because I was bullied and guilted into it by the instructor of my children. And he said, you know that you are a bad influence by the Ooh. fact that you are here watching your children, but not participating in this class, if you were a good parent, Whoa. you would <laughs> join in with them and like, participate with them. And you like would also be words. my student. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So, I mean, now look, so I'm looking back at this now, 20 years from later and thinking, wow, that was not okay. That was not cool. It was, it was bullying, um, it was uh, typecasting, um, it was, but it wasn't something that I caught because it was 20 years ago and I didn't know, right? Yeah. And I was at the time involved in um, a relationship that was not healthy for me at best. And um, anyways, I, but I did it. I got on the floor and guess what? I loved it. I was terrible at it. Oh, I was so awful at it. I was absolutely convinced that I would never, ever, ever be able to be a decent martial artist. I was in, uh, totally uncoordinated, incapable of learning even the simplest of techniques. Uh, my two kids would laugh at me, uh, you know, and I was in my mid thirties by this time, right? Like when I first started this, right? And, uh, but I thought I'm going to persevere because I can't show to my kids that I'm a quitter. I, if, if I expect mm. them to commit to this, I can't give up. And I'm so glad I didn't because guess what? It turns out I'm actually pretty okay as a martial artist. I'm actually pretty good. I got some skills. And, <laughs> um, you know, once I got over the white belt thing and started working my way up, um, I, I feel pretty good about myself as a martial artist. And both of my children, by the way, quit before they got their black belts. Oh, um, dang. Yeah, so I'm the only one who ended up with a black belt. So far, one of them wants to come back. So okay, we're hoping. Okay, well, yeah. yeah so that's I, how I got I, involved. That's that's a story. I I think that it, it's so interesting, right? Um, you know, as you're sharing your story, because you don't know until you know. Like you don't know that somebody's uh, saying something that has like microaggressions or. Um, uh, has signs of toxic masculinity or different stuff like that until later when you're introduced to it and you look back and you go, oh. <laughs> um, and yeah. so, many, so many times we get involved, a lot of um, the different women who I've talked to, uh, myself included, 
you know, got involved in the martial arts originally for, um, for different reasons um, that weren't so savory, but, you know, it has been beneficial in our lives. It's something that um, has taught us resilience and fortitude and sacrifice and so many other wonderful um, skills. You know, I think um, that it is really amazing to see just what can happen um, when you apply yourself um, to something that you're passionate about. So yeah, sure. you've been doing this for 34 years, not to say you're- No, 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 that's when I started, was I was, started. I was in my mid thirties. So I've been doing it for about 20 years. I'm in my mid fifties now. Okay, I was gonna say, <laughs> you look so- That's okay, so, I don't mind telling my age. So I am good. <laughs> very happy to embrace my age. I there am you go. 55 years on this planet and very, very, very happy to say that. There you go. Yeah, it's so interesting this um, this last year because um, a, a lot of people went natural, like went all natural. Yeah, did, did the whole all natural gray thing. Um, and there were so many people who I, I didn't even know had gray hair. And so I was like, <laughs> wow. So you can just barely see that what's the remnants of my red tips here oh there you go I had dyed my hair as soon as I started going gray I basically decided that I was too young to have gray hair not going to happen and my hair is naturally a very 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 dark brown uh, almost oh, black okay. but not quite very dark oh, wow. brown and I thought you know what I think at my age it's about time I'm ready to become a redhead my personality certainly suits it so I was a uh, redhead for oh, uh, 10 no nah, probably not 10 years maybe six six years and then yeah. now with the with the the pandemic, I decided to embrace my my gray, Your embrace wisdom. my white. It's mostly white at this point. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it suits you. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. So you're involved in so many different areas, um, not just in the martial arts realm. You're involved in ESD. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Oh, ESD. So uh, I started my ESD when I became unsatisfied with my first Taekwondo instructor. So my first Taekwondo instructor, the one who bullied me into starting in the first place, um, was very uh, keen on teaching women self-defense. But he, of course, was teaching women self-defense uh, in all the ways that we do not need self-defense. And so I started to become uncomfortable with that and started to explore further. Eventually found my way to the National Women's Martial Arts Federation, the NWMAF, and went to several of their conferences where I met some amazing people, including two instant and lifelong, very, very dear friends who will remain with me forever, no matter what happens, uh, which is just gifts unlooked for, but so wonderful to, to have. And, uh, and then from there, I just became more involved and in, learned more about the community, met more people, uh, honed all of my skills, did a whole bunch of reading, took classes, really understood what ESD was about, and began to incorporate all of that in my teaching in the Taekwondo school that I was at. Um, and then again, in the second Taekwondo school that I joined when I, when I switched away from my first one. And... Uh, and then I'm on Facebook one day and I see uh, Yudit's um, post. Hey, I have this weird idea. Is anybody, would anybody be interested in this? And I think it's within 10 minutes of her posting that very first, I have this idea for a scaled, larger, bigger, more global ESD um, adventure. And within 10 minutes, all I did, all I answered her on the Facebook was, I'm in, tell me what I need to do. And so, and ever since then, I have been as involved as I possibly can be given my time schedule with everything I can possibly be involved in with ESD. Um, going to meetings, um, traveling, meeting people, creating curriculum, whatever it is that I could do to help make this up force, a real force in the entire world. I am 100% behind this vision and I, I work very hard to make sure that it comes about as best I can with my skill set. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I, I really love with ESD is that there are just um, so many practitioners, martial arts practitioners, particularly mm -hmm. who 
um, who are taking ESD and it doesn't have to be a one size fits all type of thing. You can modify it um, to fit whatever your, uh, well, I guess it would be a one size fits all <laughs> in, that, in that sense, but, um, but you can modify and take um, all of the different tools basically. Um, right. So I see ESD as like a toolkit and you add it to your expertise and your skill set and whatever you have um, that is within you. And then you bring that forward to your students. Um, right. What and would you say with that? Yeah. So I, I think that what has, uh, and we've, it, it, this is not new. And I'm not saying anything that there are hundreds and hundreds of other women who have been through this for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years haven't already said forever. But the real difference is that the shift has been, and I, I, I lived through the shift myself personally, even though others have come before me, I didn't, I, I made that shift. I started making that shift on my own as so many of us do in the world. We're like, this isn't right. There's gotta be something more out there. There is, mm -hmm. but we just don't know it yet. And yeah. the difference between those of us who come to it from martial arts is that martial arts tend to be very rigid. They tend to be very attached to their own specific style. Yes. They tend to be indoctrinated in this is the only way, or this is the right way, or this is the best way, yes. instead of being open to this works for me. This doesn't work so well for me. Mm -hmm. I like this technique. This technique makes me feel uncomfortable. And even, even with me, so I'm very invested in my martial arts. Um, I decided that with martial arts, I was going to go deep rather than go broad. So I am, I only do Taekwondo. I am hyper-focused on Taekwondo. I'm hyper-focused on a specific style of Taekwondo. I have, um, you can see them up here, uh, books books and books and books oh, about Taekwondo. I, I, was, I was like candy <laughs> <laughs> and candy about Taekwondo that I study and study <laughs> and study so that I really understand all of the techniques and nuances so it was a real shift for me in the ESD world to be able to sort of say huh I like that technique I don't like that technique this one works for you this one doesn't work for you this one works for me and to have that flexibility and to understand that Realistically, especially for uh, vulnerable people, for women, for marginalized people, there's a whole slew of techniques that will work Yes. in the situation and that we don't need to match a very specific difficult technique to a problem in order to go through it. Like you said, a, a, a variety of skill sets that we have, that we've learned, that we've become empowered with to see what works. And what works for us and what works for the situation. And most of the time, it's not going to be a complicated martial arts technique. So Almost never say, will it be. What would you say, because you're, you're touching on it already, what would you say the difference is between martial arts and self-defense? <clears throat> There's so many differences. And I wish that I had a soundbite of an answer for this. I don't, sadly, right now. I think modern day martial arts, while they're all sourced in combat arts, now fulfill a much more artistic function. While they still might be useful, uh, they're more artistic than I would suggest they were when they were originated. Uh, exceptions being things like Taekwondo, which which also was originated as an art, as an exercise form in the 1950s, um, rather than something that was specifically developed for combat thousands mm -hmm. of years ago, even though they borrowed from that. And so um, martial arts brings a lot of different qualities to it. Uh, there's qualities of, of physical um, endurance, uh, physical perfection, physical uh, tools and techniques and kata that you do um, sparring, where you're not intending to hurt somebody, all of these things play into it. ESD, empowerment in particular, is a way of living your life that embodies you as an entire person, mm -hmm. your relationships with other people, yeah. and the culture that we're all steeped in. Mm -hmm. None of those can be accessed 
entirely through martial arts. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also just with ESD, I know that um, ESD simplicity is best. You know, mm -hmm. when I was when I was studying martial arts, I I loved doing it fancy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, like with the size. Oh, there was a sai kata. It was a sukenchi tahaku, and it was 129 moves. Mm -hmm. And I just loved going through that that kata, and you know, and um, and I think about it and. Uh, there's like you you say it basically it was something that was um, meant to be a um, a form of defense so like you're going through the kata and I can understand the logistics of it if I was fighting against somebody who had a samurai sword and I wanted to break it uh, <laughs> exactly and, and are there people in the world who are running around with samurai swords? I mean, there was one person in Canada years ago, but uh, the likelihood is that I'm not going to see one as I, you know, walk around the streets in Lahaina. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and I love kata. So we call yeah. them tool in, in, okay. my, in my art. Uh, I absolutely love doing them. There is so much value in them in terms of the, uh, the, I really value the perfectionism of working on small details, small details. So you learn the basic moves and then you keep working on your body to get those small details. Um, and I love the connection to my body that that kata gives me. I, mm -hmm. it, for me, that's meditation. It's physical meditation, which is the only kind of meditation that I can do because my brain does not go that direction. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I think that it's really valuable in a lot of ways, but it's not self-defense. Yeah. Right? Because most of the time, especially as women, we are not engaged in physical combat with people. We're engaged in conflicts and in creating a safe space around ourselves for us to be ourselves, for people who are not willing to uh, let us operate as that safe space, like my first Taekwondo instructor who violated my safe space by bullying me and typecasting me into a role that I may or may not have wanted to do with a different kind of discussion, but that's self-defense. That's most of the self-defense that we're that we're yeah. dealing with. If if, it, if we have to have use physical techniques, fine. It's not that we can't do that. It's not that we're not capable of doing that. Um, but to only consider that isn't enough. And we know this. This is again. This isn't new. I'm not saying anything that hundreds yeah. of women before me haven't well, already said. <laughs> I think you know what something that you're you're touching on is something that happens to a lot of different women who go into a martial arts school. Um, you know, they go in because they want to learn skills, they want to be empowered. Maybe they're doing it to support another person in their life who is mm -hmm. is doing it. Um, but the process uh, can be very disempowering and. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just know, um, you know, in your journey, uh, when you went through your process of going up the ranks, what were certain disempowering situations that you were in and how did you handle those um, so that you could move into a place of empowerment? Wow. Okay. Long story. Specifically with martial arts, um, yeah. the the and you you know some of this so I know that you that you asked this question so um, it did not stop with my first instructor bullying me into that uh, my first instructor uh, while he was uh, on the surface and probably legitimately very keen on helping women defend himself he definitely moved into that space where he there's the hierarchy he knows best we know nothing um which is the problematic the type yeah it's problematic the type of self-defense that he taught was very much uh related to stranger danger and being grabbed on the street and the, the very typical 
you know, make sure you guard your drinks when you go to the bar, don't walk home alone, uh, wear appropriate shoes, um, don't go jogging, don't wear a ponytail, don't have your AirPods in, don't, all of that kind of anything. stuff. It's just very, very typical of that. Um, as well, there was absolutely privilege in that school and that class, um, in those classes uh, for males. Um, so there were certain uh, bonus clubs, let's call them, that uh, even though theoretically women were allowed to participate in, no woman was ever quite good enough to ever be able to participate in that group or that, that club or that activity. Um, Interesting. Yeah, very much. Um, I was reading an article not long ago that appeared somewhere in my in my social media and I have so much of that right now that it's hard to keep track of it that was talking about how to tell whether or not a club is female friendly and of course one of the main markers is if you walk in and there's no women there so there's no women instructors there's no women black belt I, I think no of any high rank I think it was that. Rachel yeah that posted that but I'm going to give you another one that most people don't think of if you walk into a martial arts club that is not owned or run by a woman, but is owned or run by a man and is full of women, question why that is. Because that happened to me in both of the art, martial arts schools that I was in, both ended up being problematic. And on the surface, they looked very female friendly. There was lots of women in the classes. The women seemed to be having fun. Uh, there didn't seem to be any outward club accepted in that first school, any outward, um, uh, noticeable mistreatment of women or disparity in the way women are treated. In the second school that I was at, uh, there was, uh, we had half the students were female, half the instructors were female, half the black belts were female. The, the female presence was really big in that school. And yet there was still a problem with the male owner of that school sexually harassing his female black belts, which is ultimately why I left that school. Yeah. And not just one, there, there are several of us um, and probably more that I don't know. So for me, this collecting of women, especially as an outward show, as something that they advertise or market or are proud of is another red flag to consider if you walk into a martial arts school knowing nothing about that school. Yeah. And it, it's, it's really important for women to tell their stories um, as well, right? So I'm really glad that I told my story because in revealing my story to other people is how I realized, which is completely typical and understandable that there are many more of us that experienced harassment um, or sexual assault from martial arts instructors that I've personally been involved with. Yeah. It wasn't just me. And we know this, again, we know this. Um, well, yeah. yeah, but then so. there's a lot of people who might be watching this who, you know, have not shared their story with other people. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and they might not know this. I know that for for me, um, at my martial arts school, I experienced some very disempowering uh, situations um, and eventually, you know, left left the school um, because there was just no way to, uh, stay and stay safe, um, while I was at my school. So yeah, for sure. um, that so, was and, really and interesting. It's, and it's, it's, it's wrong of me to say everybody knows this. What I, let me just clarify what I mean by that. What I mean is the people who are involved in ESD, who teach CSD, who are primarily the group of people that I hang around with now, this is not new information for them. We've known this for years and years. That's why organizations like the NWMAF exist. So it's not, when I say everyone, that's usually the group that I'm thinking of. What I really should be saying is for the people who are, because I remember being that person. I was that person. My son wants to take Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles school. And so I <laughs> sign him up with one, right? I don't know. I remember not knowing what, what to look for and what it feels like. So for anybody who's listening to this, who doesn't know anything about a martial arts school, <laughs> red flag, there's no women in the school, red flag, there are a lot of women in the school. And with a male owner who emphasizes that fact, 
talk to the women, talk to the women that are in the school and, uh, and get a good, good story and a good feel for it. Yeah. And if you have a story and you feel comfortable doing so, I would never suggest that anybody share a story that they don't want to, but if you can, um, and someone comes up to you and says, Hey, tell me the real story about this school. Tell them because it's important for us to share our stories so that we know that we're not alone. There are so many places in my life where you feel alone. Mm-hmm. And then you find out that somebody else has had the same experience and suddenly you're not alone. And it is such an affirming feeling. Yeah, I definitely, it, it resonates. I, um, I know that um, there are a couple of uh, martial arts schools who have had uh, like free self-defense classes for women. And mm-hmm. um, in a way it seems almost like a, you know, a, a breeding ground for predators where you have Um, these men who are in there teaching women from an authoritative uh, standpoint. Um, I even know specifically like one of the instructors who has been asked at multiple uh, locations and different cafes to stop taking unwanted videos of women. Um, You know, so those are different things that I think, you know, uh, a free self-defense class sounds great. But then if you want to do a little bit of a background check, what are they teaching you? Are they teaching you boundary setting? Are they teaching you de-escalation tactics? Are they teaching you about awareness? Um, Are they teaching you about red flags? Like all of those different things are very, very important to pay attention to. Um, And also think about the language. So one of the things that I am finding with um, with certain martial arts schools, they're trying to, they're, they're starting to tap into the language. So many of them will say that they teach empowerment or empowerment self-defense. You have to talk, you have to dive a little deeper and talk to them a little more to determine whether that's truly what they're teaching, just because they're using that language now. Uh, they're using language like awareness and assertiveness, and even boundary setting is starting to come into some of these. But when you dive just a little deeper into the actual curriculum that they have, the types of classes that they have to make sure that that really does align with what we mean when we say empowerment self-defense which is that for so I'll give you an example awareness so a lot of people use the word awareness in their advertising we teach awareness Um, typically one of the ways that, that that people teach awareness is to say you have to be aware of your distance to another person you have to be aware of where you are on the street you have to be aware of whether it's light or whether it's dark where the nearest uh, help is um, whether or not if you yell you're going to get help that sort of thing for me for empowerment self-defense awareness is what is my relationship with this person how well do they listen to me do they yes. respond to me when i put a boundary up do mm-hmm. they are they flexible when we have to negotiate something where neither one of us is quite in the same pathway um, are they doing anything that's harmful to me do they tend to manipulate me so that to me is a different kind of awareness and that's what i mean when i say awareness in my classes not yeah being aware that there's a stranger following you down the street, you know, or that there's someone getting too close. Also useful, don't misunderstand me, but most of what we do for real self-defense is in our relationships with other people. That's where we mostly have to use it. Yeah. So um, for those watching, one of the statistics that um, really um, boggles the mind, but it, it's also very true is that, you know, 85 to 90% of people who attack you are people mm-hmm. who you know. So um, the stranger danger and different stuff like that, well, it's not to say that those things don't occur because they do. Um, you know, the awkward situations that you have when you're um, working at an office and uh, your male coworker is, is there and making things uncomfortable or um, you're, you have an authoritative figure who is uh, demanding certain things of your time that make you feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have this idea a lot of times when it comes to self-defense that it's going to have to be the, these physical moves um, as opposed to like a mental sparring match, which uh, is something that can happen uh, often, you know, like, exactly yeah um yeah so uh, you've been doing this for a really long time um what is you know an inspirational story that you can share about either um yourself or a student when it comes to empowerment self-defense training 
Oh, okay. Uh, I have lots, which is great, right? It's one of the, the things that is so lovely about being involved in this world is that you hear so many of these wonderful stories. I, I really want people to think and to understand that sometimes a success story may not look like what it is. And that's one, one of the ones that I want to share. So most, a lot of my work, much of it is spent with teenage girls. So I work mostly with um, high school students, and, which I love. And the when I first became involved with uh, some of the girls in high school, the biggest message I got from them is, we don't know what to do. So it wasn't that they so much that they didn't think that they were capable of doing it, or they didn't understand that they could fight back, or they could be empowered, but they're like, I don't know what to do, but what do I do? I mean, like, I get into the situation, and what do I do? And the most inspirational thing for me is when I get the remarks back at the end of the class, the comments that's in the feedback that says, I know what to do now. And it's all the difference in the world because I know what to do. If this happens to me, I'm going to do this. If this happens, I'm going to do this. And they start being able to think about it in, in a way that allows them to approach every stumble that becomes a self-defense situation in a, hmm, what do I do about it? Well, well, here's my toolkit, like you said, right? Here's open up my toolkit. I have all these tools in front of me. We're going to go with this one. So one of my inspirational stories uh, is a student who uh, told me a situation where I was teaching them um, uh, impact calls and reversals. So pins on the ground and how to um, to get somebody off of you if they were pinning you on the ground. Mm -hmm. And after class, which I, which I do frequently in classes, um, after class, she comes up to me and she says, I was in a situation and I tried that and it didn't work. Mm. And I said, tell me more. So she explained the situation to me and I'm going to get emotional. I'm just going to warn you. It's okay. Because I can already feel it welling up. So she told me that she was in an abusive relationship and her uh, boyfriend was about to sexually assault her and that she was pinned to the ground. <clears throat> and she tried uh, a similar move to the one that I um, taught her. Hold on. And she says it didn't work. And I said, so tell me more. And she said, well, I mean, I got him off me eventually and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm not with him anymore. And it's fine. And I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on. Stop for just a second. She says, I wanted to know what I did wrong so that I can do it right the next time. And so I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on. Stop for just a second. You were in an abusive relationship. You were going to be sexually assaulted or you were feared that this was what is going to happen. You stopped him. You weren't sexually assaulted. You got out of the relationship. You're here now. That was a success. And she didn't see it as a success. She saw it as a failure because the move didn't work. She yeah. did it right and she got out and she was fine. Yeah. And when I say fine, yeah, obviously there's some trauma there. Obviously this is a heavy thing. There's a lot that she has to think about and deal with. But the first thing that to think about was to remove the idea that she had failed. She didn't fail. That mm -hmm. was a success. And just to see her go from, oh, I failed, I failed to, wait a minute, hey, yeah, I got out of that relationship. I'm no longer with that dude anymore. I'm never going to let anybody treat me that way again. That was a success. And most of the stories that I hear that are successes, we don't consider them successes because they stopped the bad behavior so early in the process that they're not quite sure that they were even attacked. Mm -hmm. And we need to start recognizing and hearing those stories as success stories. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's I important mean, to do I that. Think part of it, um, you know, I've, I've heard different instructors of like, I've helped these women get out of this many attacks. And it's like, well, how, how do we prevent it, the attack from even starting? How do we prevent it from even going into a physical realm? Mm -hmm. Because um, that, that to me, you know, is, is the direction that I want to be able to um, help women to go. Obviously that you can't, you can't 
um, plan out everything and have everything mapped out, there are going to be times when you're going to be in situations that make you feel extremely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a success. I, I've had um, students where it, it's a very similar story to what you're sharing with me. Thank you so much for sharing with me, by the way, um, where you know they, they were just really shaky and they're like, oh my gosh, this <clears throat> is so scary. I Mm -hmm. um, tried this one thing and this didn't work, but then I tried this other thing and that worked. And then I got out, but it was so, you know, like, I just want to know how to do this one thing or this other thing. The whole point of what we're doing is to show you different pathways. Uh, right. we're not going to have every single answer we can try and we can give lots of different options, but no, uh, no two situations are going to be exactly alike, especially in an attack. Um, and especially because it's you who's experiencing it. Uh, you know, it's one thing yeah. to look at something that's happening uh, from afar, or you read something in the news and you're like, oh, that's awful. Uh, but then it's another thing to be experiencing it and being like, oh my God, what, what's just going on? Because Definitely. you might respond a completely different way. Um, so, you know, I think that it's really great that you've been doing this work for such a long time and you have these success stories. I'm calling them success stories because that's what they are. They are success stories for sure. Um, yeah. So just having people under understand that, um, you know, you you have been um, so involved in so many different areas. You also um, have spoken at like the VPEC um, conference. Oh, I was there the first year. I w I didn't. I wasn't a speaker. Okay. Um, what was I was that? there as part of the master instructors group that met in Israel in February of 2020, right before the conference. Oh, and you were teaching? I was not teaching. Well, we were, so the master instructors who were invited uh, to that particular um, week of work were uh, involved in a number of different ways uh, in just helping um, and, and learning and, um, and, uh, not formally teaching, but being available to people. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. And then we were doing our um, our own understanding of how we could be involved in um, empowerment, self defense in the world going forward. So it was a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I personally was not teaching in that. In that, we had uh, several level one classes that happened there, um, but I wasn't involved in teaching them. Okay. Uh, but you have been uh, teaching different level one trainings in different areas of the world. Um, so, you know, when it comes to these trainings, um, what are some of the, um, what, what sets them apart from going into a dojo on a weekly basis and getting getting trained there in a uniformed exercise um, as opposed to going to one of these level one trainings? Oh, wow. Well, the, the intensity is, is the big one. So um, the, the level one trainings, just for everyone who knows, is something that ESD Global does as a way of bringing together instructors from um, all over the world who want to learn to be ESD instructors. And they go through a one week intense training um, every day, all day, learning different skills that they would need to be uh, ESD teachers. And it is intense. It moves very, very quickly. There's a lot of information to absorb. Um, and so that's kind of the difference uh, in terms of, as opposed to going to a dojang or a dojo once a week and taking an hour's class and having fun and getting sweaty and going home, right? Yeah. Uh, but the difference, the difference though, in terms of what empowerment self-defense is, is that there's a huge variety of skills that you learn. There's a lot of skill sharing between different people, um, people who are good at different things and have different skills and, and values. And so we share those all with each other. Yeah, I'm not sure how else to answer the question other than that. Um, it's just the difference between, I mean, we do physical stuff, and the physical stuff is fantastic, but most of it is not physical because the physical techniques that you need 
and I know that there are plenty of people out there in the world that will disagree with me on this, especially martial artists, the physical skills that you need to be able to defend yourself in the unusual case that you have to use physical self-defense are a small set of skills that can be relatively easily learned and that will stay with you for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And if you're not teaching that, you're probably not teaching ESD. You're teaching something else. Something else. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, do you have any events that are coming up that are notable that you want people to know about? I am going to Prague for the um, Violence Prevention Education Conference, which is fantastic. I just found out about that. I'll be teaching a level one in LA in November. Um, Those are the book things that I have coming up. That's very cool. And then um, what kind of book are you working on right now? (laughs) What kind of book am I working on right now? I am working on... Or short a, story. The novel. Oh, yeah. Which one? Well, I have a bunch of short stories. The, the short story work is constant. Um, I am working on a. Uh, my short story that I'm working on right now is one of uh, a story about a fairy, an elderly fairy woman, a fae woman, and a mother of a newborn child. And they are um, trying to find common ground based on the historical animosity between their two races in a, in a, in a time and a place where the, the mother of the newborn is very vulnerable and very afraid of Aww. the fey woman. Yeah, so... Um, and then the novel that I'm working on is I'm working on a fantasy story um, that has to that is set in a fantasy world where I draw inspiration from Western Africa, salt mines, Sahara Desert, and the communities around the edges of that desert and the crossings of the desert with magic and mm-hmm women uh, who are guarding the wells of this, both physical water wells and magical wells and the conflicts that they get into with each other. Wow. As they vie for the very scarce resources that they have at the edges of this desert. That sounds very cool. (laughs) Well, how can people get in touch with you if they want to know more? Probably the, I would say the best thing to do would be to go to my website, uh, which is ironfanmartialarts.com. I do believe that website may be broken right now because pandemic uh, basically have not been able to run my Taekwondo school, my empowerment school for the last year and a half. And so it, and I've lost my location. I basically have to start all over again with that. The, the website may be broken, but I believe people can still contact me through that. So it is ironfanmartialarts.com. And there is also a Facebook page with the same name. Awesome. So they can find okay. me there as well if the website's still broken that <laughs> they can't email me. <laughs> well, there you go. I um, yeah. definitely, I'll have. A, a link to your website and everything in your bio as well so that people will be able to find you through that on the YouTube awesome. description. Um, Sheila, thank you so much for coming on. This was thank great. you for having me. It was yeah. great to see your smiling face and Yay. to be able to, to chat with you. And I yes. love what you're doing with this, uh, with these videos and I really enjoy watching them. So thank you for inviting me to participate. It's super fun, and I get to meet some of the most amazing women all over the world. So very, very cool. Yeah. Great. Well, Love aloha, it. folks. Check out uh, her description and her link in the bio uh, for more information. And keep watching. Subscribe, like, comment. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. <laughs>